down there at the ring to keep my head out, you know, protect my head at least. Mm -hmm. Now, now the waist, the waist gunners put extra flak suits. Out of gra besides wearing one. Okay. They were heavy too. And uh, putting the flak suits on the ground protected them from flak. Yeah, flak coming up. Right. They take extra ones up there. Of course, they all had. Uh, Black helmets too, mm -hmm. and there was throat mics in those days. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. Which you didn't have to hold anything because you were on oxygen anyway. And throat mics, and they, they worked very good. Then, of course, as you're coming near the target, the uh, bombardier would have to go back to Scotland. Well, we went to Bedford, then to London, then up to because most of the crews were lucky if they finished 15 missions. Yeah. Somehow we made it. Oh, well, that's good. So, uh, it was, I, I didn't mind it. Whatever happened, happened anyway. I know after every mission, when we came back, we go for interrogation. But before we go into the interrogation room, somebody would be standing with a big bottle of scotch. They give you a shot if you wanted. Then, you know, then they. Questions going, what did you see? How many airplanes went down? If, if you seen the airplane was crippled, how many parachutes opened and whatnot, you know. Mm. Then after we, then, you know, when we come back uh, from Bedford after, you know, after being out, that'd be like 10 o'clock. You, you never know if you're going on the next, next day on a mission or not. Mm -hmm. So you go to bed before you know, 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, the first sergeant comes screaming in there, mission today, and that's it. And you had to go. The, uh, oh, it was a good experience. Did you like England? Yeah. I went to, well, you, know, you see, when we were there, like, in London, at the, everything was blacked out, and a lot of places were bombed out, especially Birmingham, you know, was really bombed out. That was the industrial section there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I haven't been back there since. I often want to go back there because United flies to a Heathrow Airport from Kennedy. So maybe someday I'll go back. Sounds like it would be an interesting trip. I, uh, I'm, I'm with the 306 Bomb Group Association, so so they make these different trips, but I, I never went with them. But, uh, what was it like during the blackout? Hard to get around? Oh, yeah. If you go to, you, you, you wouldn't know where you're at. Sure, it was all blacked out. Sure. And you'd hear every so often sirens going off and that. You uh, ever uh, involved in a V1 or V2 attack? No. No. Not at that time, anyway. I think all that was before when they had that, when they had all those uh, German bombers coming in and bombing them. That was like, what, probably about. 40 or so, 41. I got there in, uh, my first mission was in uh, December of 43. Then we finished all our missions be just before D-Day. I think it was in, uh, sometime in May. I, I got a list of the missions here. Okay. I made copies of them. Trains flying the relay ship, the air sea rescue and all that, which you'll see on there. Relay ship was nothing but uh, radio communication. The B-17 was in the Bombay area, had all radio, and they relayed messages back and forth. Weather ship? Yeah, it was a weather ship that we'd go on. What's spare? Pardon? Spare. Well, you had to have so many spares in case, in case the original one conked out, maybe the engine went down, then you'd take their place as their foreman might have engine problems right so you have to have so many spares on hand flying up there so as soon as they were formed and you became redundant then you went back to uh, base or did, did the spare go on the complete mission? oh no 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 that's a once once they're finished then you, okay. it's just a waste you're up there for a couple hours for nothing just for the ride if, if you know if if everything went good with the other airplanes you have to come back Today is uh, February 28th, year 2001. We're at uh, Ronkonkoma. We're interviewing Michael J. Harbin. 
The interviewer is Michael Akey. Uh, where were you, where did you grow up, sir? I was born in Elizabeth, New Jersey. But after about, I, was, I was only about a year old, my family moved out to Long Island. And I, as a child, I was living on uh, Clarence H. Mackey's estate. Oh. My father was one of the caretakers. So I lived there with my parents. Well, I had a brother and uh, three sisters. And then we finally moved to a small town called Albertson. And that was back in 1936. And uh, there was a couple of nurseries and three dairy farms at that time over there. It was very rural. So then uh, I went to Roslyn High School. I didn't finish high school. I, I left high school in the third year. And then I took uh, a training course for aircraft. Uh, this was sponsored by the federal government in the Swanica High School. So I, I, I completed that, and then I did get a job at Grumman Aircraft. So I was working at Grumman Aircraft, but I got bored with that, so then I went to the Army Air Corps. What were you doing at Grumman? I worked in the sheet metal department. Mm -hmm. But uh, I couldn't stand uh, being cooped up and everybody else going to service, so I went back and uh, I wound up in the Army Air Corps. Why'd you pick the Air Force? Well, that, I uh, always wanted to be around airplanes. Mm -hmm. I used to, when I was a child, I used to look up when the, a couple airplanes used to fly by and they, we had those uh, dirigibles and I used to go to Roseville Field at that time where they had this small airport. That's where Lindbergh took mm -hmm. off. What was, what was Roosevelt Field like then? Oh, it was very rural. It was like a, <laughs> like a farm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was nothing there mm -hmm. compared to what it is now. It's a big uh, shopping mall now. Yeah. What, what type of aircraft were coming in and out? They were all light aircraft. I, I really didn't know too much about what they were. They had a couple of hangars there, but I wasn't too familiar at that time. So you, you joined the Air, Army Air Corps? Uh, 1942. 1942. I was uh, 21 years old. Then. Okay. Of course, I, I was at Camp Upton. Then from Camp Upton, I wound up at uh, Miami Beach, Florida. We, we took basic training. What was basic training like? It, it was 10 days. It was nice. It was nice. We were at the... Uh, they put us up in the hotel, which was called the William Penn Hotel. But I guess it's all demolished. Because there was no air conditioning in those days uh, like it is now. And uh, after basic? After basic, I went to uh, aircraft. Uh, in North, Car in North Carolina, I went to an a aircraft maintenance uh, school. I was there, uh, oh, I don't remember how, I, I passed the course there anyway. I don't know how long I was there. I don't remember now. That was at, uh, I can't remember the name now. Okay. Oh, Go Goldsboro, North Carolina. That's where the aircraft school was. And then from there, they sent me to a factory school in Santa Monica, California on A-20s. I went there, and I stayed with the A-20. I flew with the A-20 all the way up to uh, Great Falls, Montana. And then the, that was at that time they were giving the A-20s to the Russians, and the Russian pilots used to fly them out, you know, to Russia from there, from Edmonton, Alaska, I guess, up to uh, uh, Russia. And then from there, I went to Tendlefield, Florida. That's a gunnery school. I think it was, I, I don't remember, that was six weeks or seven weeks. And then we went to Alexandria, Louisiana for crew training. That's where we formed crews. Mm -hmm. Where were you uh, when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was at home that time. Okay. Yeah. Well, what was the feeling like when uh, the news was announced? Oh, I, don't, I don't quite, I, I don't know if I gave it much thought about it, you know, because when Roseville come on with that, that you know, Pearl Harbor was attacked. But, so I don't know. Now you formed uh, your crews where? Alexandria, Louisiana. Okay. Alexandria Air Force Base. And uh, what was your uh, position in the crew? Uh, top turret gunner. Engineer. Well, the engineer top turret gunner. That's the way it was. 
what were the guys like? Well, we, we, we had a nice crew here. Well, one of the fellas there at that, uh, after about, I don't know, four or five missions, he was the kind that was, uh, he kept to himself. He was always writing letters home. He uh, never went with us to town. I mean, he, he was absorbing all this. That one, one night they got up screaming. His name was Hurley. God help Hurley. God, he went berserk. Hmm. So they had to take him away. What was... Uh you were in Alexandria, what, Louisiana? Yeah. What was that like, you know, the well, going into town? It was very congested because you had all the other uh, ground servicemen, like artillery, infantry men. It was a very, very uh, congested area, and, and the Air Force Base was there, too. People were friendly? Oh, yeah, very friendly. I mean, yeah, they were very nice. So uh, how long were you there? I don't quite recall how, how long it was for the crew training. Must have been at least a month or so, I don't know. Who is the crew, ca who is the captain? The captain? Uh, uh, Bill Reader. What kind of guy was he? Very nice, yeah. I, I haven't kept, uh, kept in touch with him. He's down in Tennessee now. And of course the bombardier was from Louisiana. We had, we had two other fellas on the crew. The, uh, tail gunner was from someplace up in New York State, and the uh, uh, the navigator was from New York State. So it was a mix. Yeah, was oh a mix yeah, crew. mix. Yeah, the co-pilot was from Utah. The bombardier was from, uh, like I said, Louisiana, uh, Wisconsin. One of the waste gunners, ball turret gunner was from Brooklyn. So it was a, it was a mixed. Uh, and you were flying uh, what? The Flying Fortress, B-17. B-17. What, what was that like? What, the airplane itself? It was a great airplane. Very good. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, what were the duties of um, the, the top gunner, top turret gunner? Top turret gunner? Well, just, just as it was. You had whatever was up above you, you know, you took care of. And the ball turret gunner was down below, right? Mm -hmm. So that was it. So whatever was forward or to the left or up, up above. Now, when did uh, when did you find out that you're going to go overseas? Oh, I, we knew already once the uh, we were forming crews that we were going to go. At first, we were going to fly across, but then they changed their mind and they sent us on the, uh, the Queen Mary. What was that like? That was some trip there. Five, I think it was five days took us to go across. We zigzagged all the way across because she was fast. No submarine could catch her. So I, I don't know, there must have been at least 5,000 of us on board then when I crossed. The, and I guess we wound up in Scotland someplace and then went down. And, and, and I come back on the SS America, which was you know, called the USS West Point during World War II. So um, your first station in England was where? That's the only station, at Thurlie. What was that like? It was a nice base, yeah, very nice. Do you get off base uh, often? Well, at, at every night that we wanted to go, because the Liberty Run used to go to Bedford, which was about eight miles away. So if you wanted to go, you just got on board the truck there, and that's it. Uh, what did... Uh, what did you think of the English, and what did they think of? Uh... No, very friendly, very good. Yeah, we we go to town, and the uh, the, the young kids, any gum chum, any gum chum, they'd be following you around for candies and my. At that time, uh, the kitchen used to put on a cardboard box full of. Uh, sandwiches with uh, apple butter in there and some Mars candy bars. Now, needless to say, that would all freeze up above anyway because it was all open waste. But uh, then we, you know, I'd take some of the candy and the other fellas and give it to the kids in town. Uh, describe your first mission. What was your first mission? That was to... Uh... Uh, was it Ludwigshaven? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. It was, I don't know if there was any fear or anticipating anything. I, I don't know. I, I don't quite remember now. Okay. I didn't pay any, really, I didn't give it any thought. 
just to not that I had any fear. I just we just went and that's it. We believed in one another as a crew and that's it. So it was a pretty tight crew. Oh yeah, yeah. We flew all the missions together. We completed together. Outside, you know, that one fella that I told you that went to Cirque, mm -hmm. they had to put a replacement in for him. So what, uh, what type of places were you bombing? Were these primarily military targets at that point? Uh, yeah, mostly factories and that, uh, yeah. Well, like we went up to Kiel. I think it was a couple of missions up to Kiel. Schweinfurt was, we didn't go on the original Schweinfurt because I wasn't overseas at that time, but I went to Schweinfurt, Berlin, and the longest mission, I think it was Staten, Germany, I, I don't know where that was, that was like 11 hours, and you had to top tour, you have to stand up, B-24s, they have a seat, you sit down, uh, 17, you stand up in that turnstile, <laughs> you stand for those uh, 11 hours. It must have been pretty cold up there. Well, yeah, well, we have electric heated suits. Mm -hmm. You put on an electric heated suit, it plugs into your gloves. First you put on the nylon gloves, and then the leather gloves you plug in, and the boots were the same way. It's all electrical. Then, of course, your oxygen. You've got to make sure your oxygen mask is nice and tight, otherwise you're going to get frostbite here if it leaks. And you've got to make sure you're shaved, so you could go like that. You have to make sure you're shaved. Why is that? Because the mask fits tight. You can't have any escape, any. So as soon as you get up to 10,000 feet, everybody goes on oxygen. And a pilot will tell you, test your guns. So you make sure you direct your guns in a proper way, and you test them. Were you escorted at all? From the beginning, we weren't. But then I think, I don't remember, it was January or February, we finally got some escort. From the beginning, there wasn't any escort at all. What the... Uh what did you have the most to fear about? Was it the, the Luftwaffe or was it the ground fire? Well, it was a combination of both because, you, you know, you got the flak coming up there. You know, they look like harmless uh, black puffs, but it was all shrapnel flying, right? First, first they would, as you're getting uh, close to the target there, they'll send up uh, either white, you'll see a white burst or pink. I guess they're trying to find a range, and then all you see, start seeing all black puffs. Then, of course, you had the, the fighters with the ME-109, Falk Wolf 190, and then towards the end, when their factories were being bombed out, like the ME-109s and that, they were use, using the Stuka dive bomber as fighters. That's all they had left. Did you see any of the Stukas? Mm. Yeah. And then, then about, I think it was around... February, one of the missions, I seen the first jet. They had, I think it was called a 210. I had it was also 262. Whatever it was, uh, you know, looked out there and I said, what the heck is that? No propellers and that, you know, and that's, that's afraid. It used to come in, just fly around the uh, uh, formation there. And I don't know if they uh, fired any rockets, but they couldn't hit anything with it anyway. Did your... Uh did your plane have any, um, uh, shoot down any German? Well, you, you couldn't get really any credit because you were in with the group, you know. So in other words, if they're coming in at 12 o'clock high or 2 o'clock high, all the top turrets are firing. So you, you really don't know who got the, so they charge it to the group. Did, uh, did the Germans have any particular tactics uh, in uh, coming in? Uh, it was the same way, whatever it is. They, they'd come in at different different areas. One time we had there were, uh, uh, they were coming in at about, like, say, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock high, and they were coming this way, and everybody was firing. And I could see as the airplane went, it seemed like he was just so close to me, overhead, you know, you could see the pilot was dead, and the airplane was coming. And I, I turned the turret around, and, I, I, and he crashed head-on with the B-17. And they both blew up. On one mission over Kiel, where you go over the North Sea, you go over the North Sea, you don't, you don't drop your bomb, bombs then. You make a complete turn, and on the way back, you drop them. Well, anyway, three to, you know, it was a very tight formation. Three of uh, B-17s locked wings and went down in flames because of very tight. 
get that real tight, and then you go back out over the North Sea. One time we ran into a snowstorm going to Frankfurt. We had abandoned it. I think you'll see it on there. It says abandoned the mission. We ran into a snowstorm. Nobody knew where the heck we were. Had to come back. Now, you have to stand for the whole mission. Uh, what oh, yeah. happens when uh, there's a call of nature? <laughs> you can't leave until the captain tells you you can leave the post. And, and, You're on lock. And, yeah, and you have to go to the relief tube wherever it happened to be. I think it was around the Bombay area. You'd have to sneak down. Well, you, you know, if we were hit so bad that the airplane was crippled, we'd have to bail out. I would have never made it out anyway. Why is that? Because you're up in the top, to, you, you wear the harness only, and, and your chest pack is laying down there. You know, you'd have to try to get down out of there, get your chest pack, and hopefully if the Bombay doors are open, you could drop down through the Bombay out. Uh, otherwise, you'd have to go down a catwalk through the Bombay area, through the radio compartment, and then into the waste and go out. That's why I used to see many times, like only maybe two or three chutes would open. Maybe the tail gunner would get out, or maybe uh, uh, one or two of the waste gunners. The ball turret gunner, forget about it. He's finished. Because he's locked in that, in that turret. Then. And of course, the radio operator had. Uh, a hatch that came down, he had one flex gun there, but he was always sitting at the uh, desk there. And of course, there used to be a plexiglass window there. Uh, they removed that and they put a chute in there. And he used to, after a while, he used to, uh, they used to put boxes of tinsels on there. They used to throw the tinsels out to disrupt the radar. Now, so, I've seen uh, in, uh, I think, a, a 24, Soundproof, uh, soundproofing in the ca in the cabin, which was sometimes taken out because of a fire hazard. In the B-24? Yeah. No, I, I'm, not, the... I'm not familiar with okay. the B-24. My Mine was always with the B-17, the Flying Fortress. I think that, that was one of the best bombers at that time. Everybody liked it. It flew well? Yeah. Every, every, well, that one mission, you could see what we... Lost those couple engines and uh, and we made it back anyway. Well, tell 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 us about that mission. That was a mission to Berlin. Yeah. Um, well, we got hit right over the target. That's okay. it. We had to drop out. Couldn't keep up. We lost two engines. So, so we were lucky to get back. So we kept losing altitude all the way back. We had to drop altitude. So we were flying sort of like banked. Anyway, coming across. Uh, Oh, I guess we were almost close to the English Channel. We looked out, there was a fighter out there, but it was, happened to be ours. He come, he come alongside of us, but we were always close to the English Channel then anyway. But we had a choice when we were still high enough if we wanted to bail out. So the pilot asked everybody on the intercom uh, what decision to make, you know. So we all agreed to stay with the airplane. He thought he could make it back. So we, I guess we got across the English Channel, maybe a couple hundred feet off the channel, and we made it to a fighter base, and we crash-landed at the fighter base. That's where we lost that airplane. That was named for the pilot, Lady Winifred. Okay. That, that's in this picture here. Let's, uh, let's see your... Now show us your... Let's see what pictures you have. All right. Well, well this is, this is uh, with the... Uh, Alexander, Louisiana. Okay, this... Now, which, uh, which fellow are you? Right here. Okay, very good. That, that's just as you've completed basic? Or your... Yeah, crew, crew training before training. we went overseas, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm on the uh, left side, second on the right. Okay. Okay. okay that, was, that was a crew train. And this was... Uh, I'm on here, top left, first one here. This was after about 15 missions. Okay, you're on the top left? Yeah. Okay. Okay, and this, this was after the completion of uh, all the missions. There's four uh, ground crew members there, too. There's two armorers and two uh, mechanics. And I'm here on the low, lower left side here. This is after the completion of all the uh, 30, 30 missions? missions, right? This was taken with the ground crew, and that's the airplane, Lady Winifred. Look at 
looked like a bunch of happy guys, relieved guys. Okay. Yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't feeling well, and, and I was laying in my bunk, and they, hurry up, we're going to take your pictures, you know what I mean? So I just grabbed the jacket, didn't comb my hair or anything, just ran out and hurry up. But that's that. So um, you, you did a total of 30 missions. Yeah. Um, as you're getting to, did you know ahead of time that uh, 30 missions would be uh, it for? No, because from the beginning it was 25, and they added on the other f five after that because they were losing too many crews. So they added five more. What did you, how did you feel when you learned that they added five more? No, we didn't give it, didn't give it a thought. Um, what were you thinking on, uh, on your 30th mission as you're taking off? Oh, I, I don't quite recall that I gave it any different thought about it than the first mission, really. After a while, you just get used to it, and that's it. You're going to go, and that's it. You were happy when you were all over because uh, fortunate to be, you know, alive. And, and uh, there's only three injuries on the crew. The bombardier got injured. Uh, uh, nothing serious uh, in the head. He got a piece of flak, grazed his head, and uh, the radio operator got hit by some uh, 20 millimeter. Uh, gunshot from the uh, ME-109s, they had the 21 shell, and, and the uh, ball turret gunner was injured, but it was all minor, oh, that's nothing cool. serious. So you land for your third, after your 30th mission, um, what happened, it, what happened then? They, they shipped us to another base, and they gave us all, gave all of us carbines mm. to be on patrol at that base, because they were getting ready now for the Normandy invasion. So how long were you on uh, on that particular base? Oh, it was only a short time because once the uh, invasion was was in progress, you know, they, they sent us to another base, which we stayed there, I don't know, a couple months, and they shipped us back to the States. I came back to the States in uh, August, August of, uh, that would be 44. Okay. Yeah, August of 44. And they sent us to a rest area, went down to Don Cesar Hotel, St. Petersburg, Florida. We were down there for 30 days, you know, whatever you want to do. Fish, swim, relax, and that. So we wound up there for 30 days. And after that? Then after that, it gave us a furlough. Came back home for a 15-day furlough. Then after that, they sent me to uh, Chanute Field for some more schooling, went to prop school, engine school, oh, I don't know, different, different, they just try to keep us busy. Mm -hmm. Then I wound up in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, and they kept us busy there for a while, and I got separated from Lincoln, Nebraska, and come home by train. In those days, everything was train. Mm -hmm. What did you do when you got home? When I got home, I went back to uh, Grumman's, but uh, I don't know. I was taking a lot of days off. Uh, I wasn't feeling. I couldn't adjust myself to uh, uh, civilian life again. So I was, I was, uh, I got laid off from Grumman's, and I never challenged it. And I figured the heck with it. So I, I went from job to job. I worked at Republic for a while, uh, Fairchild. Then I joined the reserves, uh, at 514 Troop Carrier Wing at Mitchell Field. I was going there on weekends. Then we got activated. So I went back in for 21 months. For Korea? Yeah, but I didn't go to Korea this time. They sort of broke up uh, the 514th, and they built up an outfit in Pennsylvania. They sent that outfit uh, overseas. In so they sent us down to Ramey Air Force Base in Puerto Rico. There was a B-36 outfit, and they were packing everything up and sent them to Topeka, Kansas. So that's what I was on that move. What was Mitchell Field like then? Oh, it was, it was a nice base. It was, nice, it was very rural at that time. Very, it was a 
beautiful. Everybody wanted to be stationed at Mitchell Field at the. Well, the same thing with Ramey Air Force Base. That was like a country club down there. That was the old Brinken Air Force Base. Then they changed it to after General General uh, Ramey. So they called it Ramey Air Force. They had a golf course. They had swimming pools. Every was, everybody wanted to be stationed there. So now it's a commercial field. What was your uh, what were your what was your job in the reserves? And, as a mechanic, okay. yeah. Well, we kept our rank, the tech sergeant. They, they kept all our rank. Yeah, as a mechanic. What kind of planes were they this, flying at that point? Uh, C-46. And the missions, generally? Pardon? What, uh, generally, the missions were... C-40, yeah, like I said, we were down there and I moved to move the uh, supplies and whatever they had down there in Puerto Rico. But it was a, C, you know, the C-46 looks like a whale, yeah, twin engine, mm -hmm. that's, that's what we're... So, uh, you got activated for Korea? Yeah, but, but I didn't go overseas. Okay. So, it's it put in 21 months, and then I, it was discharged. Then I, once again, I got out, I worked for United Parcel, different places. <clears throat> I didn't want to go to the airlines. Because I know I was going to be on midnight, but then after I said to myself, "Hey, I better get myself together, and, and get started somewhere," so I went to United Airlines, applied for the job. In those days, it was they were very strict. It took me three days of different interrogation tests and whatnot to get the job, and I got the job at uh, Kennedy, and I was there for 37 years. United, I worked all three stations. Kennedy, Newark, and LaGuardia. I finished up at LaGuardia. Uh, how, did, did you stay in the reserves for any length of time after? No, after that, no, I decided to drop out. I, I didn't want to get involved anymore. You paid your dues? Well, more, more or less, but it would be a hindrance on my job, too. Because uh, when I started with United, it was midnight shift, till your seniority put you on the afternoons, and after, took me, uh, it took me 30 years to make the day shift before I could make the day shift that was at LaGuardia. And then 1980, there was a cutback. Things were bad. So now, according to seniority, you had to go bump different fellas at different stations. So my train came. I was supposed to go to Chicago. And I said, well, I'm not going to go to Chicago. Uh, I took the furlough. I took the furlough, and I got called back nine months later. Other fellas wound up in Hawaii, L.A., Frisco, wherever, you know, wherever they could bump the seniority. But that's the way it was. But United was a very good place to work. I worked the flight line, which was very nice. It was all outdoors. So we kept busy. You know, take, receive the aircraft, do a walk around, check them, and uh, dispatch them. So you've been around airplanes all your life? Yeah. Did you get married? Yeah, I got married, but it was it was a mistake. <laughs> Never got along, so I have, I have a one daughter. How would uh, how would you sum up your uh, your experience in the military during World War Two? Was I, there any I, lasting impression? I, no, I, I I really enjoyed it. I liked it. Really, I liked it. It was we're in with a I guess like with any branches, with a bunch of good fellas, and, and especially like with the flight crew, we were all like a, like a family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was, Did you keep in touch with any of them? Uh, no, no. I do have the address of uh, the pilots down in Tennessee there somewhere. Maybe someday I'll get in touch with him, see if he's around. But some of them have passed away anyway. Like the ball turret, you want to pass the way. Uh, uh, the bombardier passed on. Uh, the others, uh, I guess the navigator too, because uh, I just see his wife's name on the on the uh, on the leaflet that comes from the 306 bombardment group. Well, thank you very much. Uh, now let's get back to after you, you completed your mission. What what uh, what did you do once you landed? 
you completed a mission. Uh, if, you get if the individual mission? Right, after the yeah. individual mission. All right. They, they took us by truck to uh, get interrogated. Okay. So you have an interrogation officer sit at the desk with each crew throughout, and they'd ask you different questions. Now, was it each individual or a group? A group? No, group. A, a group. A crew. The crew. Okay. Each group. Of course, there were many tables, different crews in mm -hmm. there from the, from the base. And they'd ask you different questions, what we seen, and how many airplanes went down, or how many fighters, or how much flak was being thrown at us, and all that was in there. That was all put down on, on record. Mm -hmm. and that. So, and, and that was it. Then after that, we if, after we were interrogated, we had to have all the fresh eggs we want to eat there in, in the mess hall, and then we started turning all our gear back in, you know, turn it back in and get ready to go back to our barracks and go to town if you wish to go to town. Liberty Run used to take us to town. You didn't pack your own parachutes or anything like that? Oh, no, 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 no. But uh, after every mission, everything was turned back in, and then next day you'd have to withdraw all that again. Mm -hmm. Of course, they, they'd send us to breakfast, but nobody ever went to breakfast before a mission, that's for sure. Really? No, you never ate. Especially you didn't want to drink any coffee either. <laughs> well, if you're going to stand for a lot of hours. <laughs> oh, sure. And then, in between, if there wasn't any flying, we had to go to skeet range to keep a, a eyes shop as, mm -hmm. as far as uh, for gunnery, you know. They always send us to a skeet range. And then we also, also they used to send us to aircraft recognition. You know, the silhouettes go across right. there so we identify a different aircraft like the ME-109. And because the ME-109 looked very similar to the uh, uh, P-51. Till the, till the P-51 after got the square tail, but they looked very similar, so you make sure you don't shoot at the wrong airplane. And then, of course, the Falk Wolf 190 was very similar to the P-47. And then, of course, there was some P-38s there, too, that we had over there that were flying there. Now, what model of B-17 were you flying? First, first, the first few missions was the B-17F. That was without the chin turret. Mm -hmm. And then they... The G came out with the chin turret. Any other differences between the two? No, it, it, basically the airplane was the same except for the added in the nose, the chin turret, mm -hmm. that's all. Who manned that? The bombardier. And of course the navigator had his desk there and he, had, he, he used to handle both flex guns wherever he had to go, either left or right. And of course he was charting the course, especially at a tough time there after we got shot that bad coming back from Berlin and shot our way back all alone back to England. Mm -hmm. Now, when you got hit at Berlin, you found out that uh, you had to drop out of formation. Oh, yeah. What was going through your mind at that point? Oh, I, everything. That was the worst. Figure, oh, my God, we're finished now. We're going to be like a sitting duck out there. But we, we're fortunate enough the way the the pilot brought that airplane back. I guess he dodged in between the clouds and that we made it back that uh, we didn't encounter any fighters. We were lucky. Because that's uh, generally what they were looking for is a wounded plane. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then that would have been the end. Mm -hmm. would have been. We all figured, well, that's it, we're finished. And, and then, i tell you truthfully, I had a fear, more fear of bailing out. I figured the heck with it, take the chance. All of us agreed on that, that we could make it back to England instead of bailing out. Because if you're gonna bail out, you're gonna bail out, you know, you, either you're gonna be killed on the ground, uh, get involved, or you're gonna be a prisoner of war, which makes it even worse. Mm -hmm. So I figured, heck, we'll take a chance. If we have to ditch in the English Channel, which, well, they, they had the ASC rescue anyway. The English used to run their patrol boats up and down the channel there, which was uh, to look out in case anybody had a ditch. Mm -hmm. Uh, what kind of equipment did you carry on a flight? Personal equipment or? Uh... Well, which we we had to draw out the uh, kit. One okay. kit was with morphine in it, a uh, compass, a uh, cloth map, and that in case we bailed out, we tried to find our way back. And the other kit was uh, uh, about three hundred dollars in French currency. Each or for the crew? Each each member had to draw that out. 
So in case when you bailed out, that's what you had. Hopefully that you could get in touch with the French underground and that would, that would money was used for that. Now you mentioned you had a, uh, your photograph was done in... Prior to any mission, we had to, which we carried with us to make sure that uh, in case we did bail out, could be identified only as a civilian if the French underground was able to help us out. Now, after every mission, you had to make sure you turned back 300 every, francs. Everything was turned back, yes. Okay. Yeah. Everything. So you had, you had, you had to withdraw all that before the mission, then turn it all back in. That was that was recorded. How often would you do a mission, generally? Oh, for a while it seemed like we were going day after day. I think there was about. One time, about three or four days in a row, one after another. Then there would be a lull if the weather was bad or whatever. But in, at that time, then we'd have to go to skeet range or aircraft recognition course. What were you shooting at skeet? Were you shotguns or? Yeah, regular regular shotguns. How were you? At the clay pigeons. Were you, were you pretty good at the? Well, I think we were all pretty good at. <laughs> that was a lot of fun anyway. But it kept us sharp anyway. Um, and and the, the in the barracks, we'd have a, there would be two crews in there. In other words, uh, the enlisted men, which was six six enlisted men, so it would be twelve men to a barracks. Mm -hmm. It had a pot belly stove. In the center, uh, orderly used to keep keep that uh, going there, and. Uh, we had double bunks. I had the upper bunk, and they used to have a. Uh, it was three pieces. It wasn't one single mattress. Three pieces. They called them biscuits. It was from the RAF. So you put the three together, and then you'd have like a horse blanket to cover it. And that's your no sheets and that. And my fleece line jacket was my pillow. Then I'd have another blanket. And of course, the outside. You know, latrine actually was outside, but you have a big cast iron, uh, like a tub where water was heated, where you get the warm water for wash and shave. Now, the flight crew. Uh... They lived separate from us. Okay. They lived in another area. They, they officers, I yeah. should say. Yeah. Now you had to. You were at least a sergeant to be in, a, in the flight crew. Well, when, it, when you get out of gunnery school, automatically as you get your wings and you pass the gunnery school, I was at Tyndallfield, Florida, but that was Panama City. Uh, you come out with the wings and the buck sergeant. Why is that? Why, why is that? They offered the, well, I guess they have to reward you with something that you figure that you're going to have to face something anyway. So it's like a reward. So anyway, after a few missions, uh, like the ball turret gunner, <clears throat> tail gunner, two waist gunners, they move up in rank to staff. And the top turret gunner, which was engineer gunner and the radio operator, they move two ranks to tech sergeant. Now what was your job as the engineer? Basically, basically nothing too much really because the ground crew was there, but that's, it happened to be that way in combat that it was basically couldn't do, didn't do anything. But we, you know, we had to install our own guns and check them out in the morning there, get them all set, make sure all the ammunition was there and all that. 50 caliber? 50 caliber, yeah. All 50 calibers. But, but you know, you had to stay at your gun position all the way till you get to the English Channel because you, you never know if a fighter could sneak up on you anyway. Usually the missions were how long? Oh, I, I guess on the average was probably six to seven hours. I really don't, I'm not sure. But the longest one was 11 hours and 15 minutes. That was the one to Berlin? And I, no, Staten, Germany. I, I, I don't recall what was there, but uh, that was the longest one. Of course, I think uh, one of them, I think, where we... Uh, uh, ran into a snowstorm going to Frankfurt. Another one where we had a abort. I think it's on there, you'll see, a mission was aboard because you had, like, 
after you form and you're going up there and then all of a sudden you have engine problem, uh, you had to drop out and tell them that you, you got to come back. Now what, uh, what fighter groups were usually providing cover? The outfits themselves by, no, I, I wouldn't remember, no. But they'd have P-47s and P-51s and some P-38s. You were in uh, what bomb group, the three? 306 bomb group, 368 squadron. Uh, which was part of the what Air Force? Eighth Air Force. Eighth, Eighth Air Force. Eighth Air Force. It was there at that time when uh, was, we had General Eaker and General Doolittle. And that was in Thurlay, Thurlay, England. And the nearest town was Bedford, which was like eight miles away. And I think London was like 60 miles away. Did you get into London? Yeah, what, well, what day a couple of times to London. It was too long of a trip, and we didn't have that much time to go there. The only time we had when we went to, uh, after I think it was after 15 missions that we, uh, uh, they gave us a furlough. I think it was 10 days to Edinburgh, Scotland. We went by train. That was quite an experience. Why was that? On those London train. Well, to give us a rest leave. Mm -hmm. Well, what did... Uh, what made the, the trip on the train so interesting? Because of the trains were so different than we have, you know, like they have the compartments. Mm -hmm. It was a nice ride. And, and uh, uh, Scotland is a beautiful, beautiful country. Very clean, neat. I know we, we were on a hotel on Princess Street in Edinburgh, and then we'd go out walking around the, the, the golf courses and the farms were so clean and beautiful, pristine. Really nice. And the people uh, generally got along with them? Yeah, very friendly, very nice. And, and they put, up a, a, put us up in a nice hotel, too. Well, that's the way it was. You never know, you, you never know on the next mission whether you're going to be back or not. So you become somewhat fatalistic about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I tell you, I never paid much attention. I said, whatever comes, comes. Of course, I'd say my prayers, but... Whatever happens, happens. What, did your um, squadron take many losses? Oh, quite a few, yeah. Did you get uh, friends with other flight crews? Yeah, I think uh, the total deaths in, in our bomb group was 700 and I think it was 734. They were, they were killed in the 306 bomb group. And, and all of 8th Air Force, I think it was like 25,000 that were killed. And so, some of them are still buried there at the cemeteries there in, in England. I think one of the cemeteries is Madden Lee or something like that it's called. But that 306 bomb group, it, it's still there, but it's, it's, it's a... Naturally, it's renamed. The RAF has it now. That that station. Did you uh, ever? Did you have much um, contact with English flyers? In the pubs, we'd we'd meet them in the pubs. Yeah, in the pubs. You never took a ride in the Lancaster or anything like that. No, I, we went to a base to to see the Lancaster. I used to see it because their their top turret. I don't know. See, our, my top turret, the, the the box of ammunition was alongside of me, and it went up this way. Theirs was the box of ammunition was about the middle of the aircraft, and it went down a long belt to the top turret. And and with the with the RAF, the top turret gunner could be a major, and a pilot could be a, only a sergeant. Why is that? I don't know. That's the way it was. Well, originally. In the Army Air Corps, we had uh, sergeants as flyers anyway, but the RAF that way, they had a uh, mixed bag that way. Pilot could be a sergeant, uh, top turret gunner could be a major. So uh, you're in the top turret, how did you sight your guns? Uh... No, we, we, we originally came out with the Sperry sight, you know, and then they, they, they said disregard the sight, no more sight. We trace every, I think it was every I don't know whether it was every third or fifth would be a tracer. Mm -hmm. So you'd, that's what you sight on a tracer. So you'd lead the, uh, 
Well, you'd, you'd lead it out, but, but, but the tracer, you'd see where the tracer is heading, then the, because you'd have different variation of uh, both you know, the armor piercing and, and uh, you know, whatever, whatever I, I don't recall now. They were, they were, they were painted different colors. Mm -hmm. Now, the, uh, the top turret gunner, how is he perceived in general? Is that a, is that a tough place to be difficult? Place oh no, I, I like it because I had a f full view of everything. The top turret gunner had a full view of all the, uh, you could see out for all over the distance, of all the formations and what, what's what. Well, the ball turret gunner would see what's below, but the waist gunners, they were limited. But the top turret had the best view of all. Yeah. Was he a prominent target? So you. you well, see, like, like you could even see down below if most of the time we're bombing through the clouds, but then you'd see, you know, as the bombs are bursting out of the ground, even though you're up there 26,000 feet and it's about 30 below zero. But, uh, so you didn't mind being a, a top turret gunner? Oh, no, I liked it. Yeah. I flew a few missions there as a waste gunner, which, which I didn't care for. And Why didn't you like that? It, it's, you're confined, you, you don't, there's nothing involved in it, you can't see anything too much. This way I had a broad view of everything. But a long way to get out. So, uh, it was interesting. I don't regret it. I don't have any remorse over it. I only was praying that if I come back in any way, I don't want to come back wounded and be in a wheelchair the rest of my life. I figured if anything happens, I'd rather be killed outright. Is that a, a sentiment shared by most of your friends? Yeah. Because, you, you, you know, if you were ever wounded up there seriously and you're bleeding, you, you're not going to make it back to the base. You're not going to, you're going to die and, and freeze to death up there. So, so what, what would have to be done is you'd have to bundle that person up, put a tourniquet on him somehow, and, and shove him out the waste, uh, waste gunner's area, the door, and pull a ripcord. Hopefully, that he, when he gets down there, the Germans would give him the medical attention or whoever would find him, because he would die anyway. He'd never make it back to the base after, you know, four or five hours of flying. So is that, stand, is that an operating procedure? If yeah. Badly wounded. Yeah. They, uh, he's badly wounded. That, because he, he would never survive anyway. Mm -hmm. If there was any chance, you know, because he'd never survive anyway. He'd bleed. Do you know of any occasions when that happened? Another. Not, not in our group, no. But I've heard of it. Hmm. I've heard of it. That was a practice that was done. Interesting. You never jumped in a parachute, did you? No, no. Probably hope we, you never would. We never, no, we never had to. No. No, well, I wouldn't even know what it would be like. <laughs> but I guess it would be so simultaneously and that, that you wouldn't give it a thought. Mm -hmm. You just out you go and count to three and pull the ripcord. Any other uh, thoughts, comments? Well, you, you, you know, like, like you fly in the top, uh, uh, top turret where you could see all the, for the formations were stacked, you know. They weren't just like this here. And of course, the ones down below was always called the purple hot corner because as the fighters come in, they'd always get those down the bottom. They'd oh, come yeah. in at 12 o'clock high, they'd get them down there. That was always called the purple hot corner. So where was the preferred place to be in the formation? Up, up close to the lead or in the center the way it come out. But as you see all the bombers out there, be oh, hundreds and hundreds of them, you see all these contrails. That's why you could see a top turret, all the contrails way up there. I guess the people on the ground could see it too. There'd be hundreds, hundreds. Uh, do you recall any missions having more German fighters than any others? Uh, right now, I, no, I really, I don't recall any, really, no. Did you feel safer when you had the, uh, the escort of the fighters? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they, they wouldn't be so aggressive then, 
like they were from the beginning when uh, we didn't have no fighter escort. But you see, they would never attack you once you're over the target. They, they wait. Either they're going to get you before they get to the target, uh, over the target, and actually fly, flak is flying all over. They're not going to go. They're going to wait till you get off the target, and then they come in at you. about it, I guess. Well, very good. Thank you. Thank you.